Hi, my name is Paul Sargent and welcome to AP European History. Listen, we're, I want to walk you through what is now Key Concept 1.3. And if your class is following along with the new AP Euro redesign, the way the College Board has set it up like mine is, this is going to be sort of the overview of this unit. And this is all about religious reform, all right? It's about the Protestant Reformation and about the religious wars that followed. So in order to sort of understand what it is, I'm gonna give you the big picture here. This is sort of, you know, big picture. Let's start with the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages saw these really, really, really bad problems happening with the church. There was a great schism which, in which part of the Catholic Church broke off from the other Catholic Church having two and at later times three different popes at the same time, each calling the other anti-popes. And thus, along with the Black Death and the Catholic Church's inability to deal with that and, and the, the ideas of people like John Wycliffe in England and Jan Hus in Bohemia who are calling for a translation of the Bible for access to the Bible to normal people and the rise of small faiths like the Brethren of the Common Life which call for a personal relationship with God. There's a problem with religion, not even to mention the Borgias, okay? That's a whole different story and one that is pretty sordid and I don't want to get into it, so just go look that one up. The idea behind a Protestant Reformation really came out of humanism. And what happened was that Northern humanists, those humanist scholars who lived up in the north of Europe, which is why they're called Northern, decided to turn their efforts of translation not to Greek and Roman classic books, but to the Bible and to the church fathers themselves, thus challenging the, ch the Catholic Church. And different ideas of how society could be started to emerge, including Thomas More's Utopia, talking about a perfect society based on very different ideals. Well, in 1517, this all comes to a head when Martin Luther nails the 95 Theses onto the church door in Wittenberg. This is a direct challenge, although not all that uncommon in practice. It was a big challenge to the church, and it was a big challenge because the printing press, oh yes, hello, shout out to Johann Gutenberg, the printing press was used by his followers to print this thing and to circulate it all throughout Northern Europe. Well, this starts a big trend. Lots of Northern German provinces, although we can't really call them German, so lots of the northern princes within the Holy Roman Empire use this as a way to get away from the central power of the Habsburg family in the south. And in the end, in 1555, they have a solution. And in the Peace of Augsburg, they decide that German princes can decide between two religions. They can either be Catholic or they can be what is now being called Lutheran. So what is Lutheranism? Well, it's the belief that Salvation comes through faith alone, not through good work. And he also calls for the priesthood of all believers, that anyone can be a priest. You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to go through uh, certain orders and be a part of this or that or the other. All you have to be able to do is to read the Bible. And in order to help that, he translates it into German so that people can read it and thus also codifies the German language into the one that he speaks. Well, as you can imagine, once the Catholic Church is challenged there, the, the number of Protestant religions explodes. When John Calvin comes along, he brings Calvinism and the idea of predestination, the idea that God has a chosen few who are going to heaven, sort of starts to take over. And it spreads into places like France and into England and into Scotland and into Scandinavia and all of these northern areas, places which tend to be geographically farther from Rome, start to really go Protestant. They all go Protestant in different ways and for different reasons. And to get into them, we're going to have to talk about some specifics. But suffice it to say this, in France, the, the Reformation ultimately fails because the monarch who follows the Reformation just kind of gets rid of it. In Spain, the Reformation completely fails because of the Spanish Inquisition. 
In Italy, it pretty much fails because of the Roman Inquisition. In uh, southern Germany, the Habsburgs hang on to Catholic control, while in the north, you see the rise of faiths such as Puritanism and Presbyterianism and uh, Anabaptism and lots of other different isms, Lutheranism being another one of them. This is going to change the fabric of Europe, and we have to understand when we look at this that these are not purely religious decisions that are being made here. People certainly want to get into heaven, but while they're here, they have some concerns too. And so a particular prince's or king's or parliament's decision to, to become Protestant in one way or another is motivated by lots and lots of factors, including independence, including sovereignty, including the desire for divorce, and including uh, the desire for trade. So, I mean, all of these things are going to come into play so that what we have during this period is we have the division of Europe. There was one thing holding it together during, during the Middle Ages, and that was the Catholic Church. And now that's no longer the case, meaning that the Catholic Church has given way to state power. State power was 1.2. Don't know if you did that one already or not. We're going to do them backwards but that's where state power is really kind of big. Now, of course, the Protestant Reformation changes culture as well because Protestantism is a little bit less focused on the church and more focused on the here and now. Think humanism. And so people's lives are going to change that live in these Protestant countries. It's also going to change the relationship of the church and the monarch or the state, because in most of the places where Protestantism takes over, the state becomes the head of the church, so that the, the, there's not some person off in Italy who's making decisions about who the local priest is or who the bishop or archbishop or whatever is. No, those are being made within the state. Thus, the church has to play some sort of a role in maintaining state power. Well, you can imagine there's conflict here. I mean, we're talking about people's souls. They take this seriously, guys. And so there's a very long period of religious wars. There are magnificent slaughters on both sides. Magnificent, not in a good way, because that's the wrong word. There are horrific slaughters on both sides, the most notable of which is the St. Bartholomew Day's Massacre in France, in which they tried to take out all of the French Calvinists. They were unsuccessful, but it was still really, really, really nasty. Not only did they do this, but throughout Northern Europe, the idea of the iconic admiration of the Catholic Church, adorning a church with beautiful statues, stained glass, everything else, and the entire cult of the saints is done away with by most Protestant sects, except the English who keep it all. But that's all because of the divorce thing. Anyway... So you have situations throughout Europe where Protestants are destroying all of these artifacts and all of the stained glass and putting, you know, replacing it with like basically nothing. So they have these whitewashed churches with just like plain windows to let in light. And it's not quite as majestic as the Catholic Church, but, and so the leaders of the Catholic Church come together and they decide at the Council of Trent that here's what they're gonna do. First of all, look, they say, We've been at this for well over a thousand years now. We're totally right. You guys are either just totally misled or you're the agents of the devil. And so, yeah, no, our doctrine is correct. However, they do admit that there are practices going on with the Catholic Church that need to be changed. They need to reinforce uh, the celibacy of the priesthood. They need to make sure the priests can read uh, Latin and read the Bible. They need to make sure that they're not selling church offices just because people are rich. They need to reform some of this stuff. But along the way, they also set up the Inquisition. So, you know, it's not like they're totally jumping in and saying we're wrong on a lot of stuff. They kind of just say, let's torture some people too. Anyway, at the end of the religious wars, the big one and the big change, that thing which is going to mark the end of our first period in European history is going to happen after a long 30 years war. And during the 30 years war, the focus of the war changes from what starts off as a religious conflict to one that becomes a dynastic, state-driven, power-driven conflict. And it marks the end of the religious wars and the beginning of a long period of state wars in which state power 
is the most important thing. And in the Peace of Westphalia, they decide that at least in Germany, or what will become Germany, there are going to be three religions that people can choose from. They can choose to be Catholic, they can choose to be Lutheran, or they can choose to be Calvinist. So that's about it. It's the dissolution of the religious unification of Europe. And that's pretty much what this concept is all about. It's got some great stories. It's got some great challenges. So hang in there and try and stick with it. It's also got a lot of uh, very interesting religious ideas that might get you to wonder just where yours come from. Anyway, that's all the time we have today. My name's Paul Sargent. That's an overview of Key Concept 1.3, which I'm calling the Reformation and Religious Wars. And uh, hey, if you like this video or if it's helping, please subscribe to my channel so you can be notified when I post more videos. And have yourself a great day. Thanks for watching.